Hello, and welcome to Better Tech. This is Jocelyn Hull. Today, we're talking about um, how startups can scale in our session, Evolving Technology Strategies and Growth Phases. We're super excited to welcome Pankaj Dingra from um, Lighthouse. Welcome. Thank you, Jocelyn. I am Pankaj Dingra. I'm it's CTO at Lighthouse Global, a legal technology company providing AI-enabled e-discovery and review solutions. I'm so glad to have you on the show. Um, two of my favorite topics. Um, I love everything Lighthouse is working on in terms of e-discovery and data management. And I'm also passionate about helping startups uh, figure out how to scale. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, both. Starting with your background working with startups, I think that's a main, that's been an interest of yours throughout your career. Is that right? Yes. So I have about 25 years of technology experience and I started my career at Microsoft and I quickly grew within the developer ranks at Microsoft. I have done my startups. So I did my first startup way back in 2006. I have worked at companies like Tableau, helping them during their growth phases. And I particularly enjoy leading the organization through this pioneer, settlers, and the town planner phases. I'm happy to share my experiences and I do hope our listeners will find some valuable insights. That sounds amazing. Let's start with, um, I'd love to hear a little bit about, um, and of course we wanna hear about your background, but what were you doing at Microsoft? So I started with Microsoft as part of ASP.NET team when .NET was being formed. And then mm -hmm. I worked at B Central. From B Central, I started working on BCM, Business Contact Manager. These were the first two suites, BCM and SBA, which were not part of Office, but they were shipped along with Office Suite. So for mm -hmm. us, that was one big accomplishment. And those were the V1 products that I worked at Microsoft. That also gave me a flavor of what it means to work in these startup uh, modes. Yeah, absolutely. That was really um, a high watermark at, my, at Microsoft where it was expanding office into like true enterprise, small business, business knowledge worker as a persona. That was a really um, important time, I think, for the overall portfolio, um, but not easy to break into maybe. <laughs> so I yes. definitely see how you have to be scrappy to do that. Um, yes, we had to be scrappy. We had to think about speed, flexibility, a lot of the things that you carry forward in your startup experience. And you've also worked with um, some other young companies in all different stages. Have you thought about, um, I think this is useful for people in startups uh, to think about like different phases of development. It's like phases of like childhood, teenager, graduate school. How are you thinking about different buckets of maturity for startups? So when you are starting as a startup, I, I think about this as a single threaded execution. This is mostly you have a single team and you're trying to optimize the focus that you have because of a single team to really think about how do you get to the finish line faster. You're operating like a sprinter, and then you start moving to the phases where it becomes a marathon race. This is more about endurance. And as you go through different phases, there are different things you have to think about um, in terms of your technology strategies, how you'd make the technology decisions. And I'm happy to get into it if you want me to uh, start talking. I do, I do. Um, I wanna make sure everyone um, has enough context too on kind of what Lighthouse does. You're the CTO, for yes. those of you who didn't quite um, catch on to the single threaded uh, metaphor, which is a beautiful technical metaphor <laughs> of extreme focus on one thing. Um, tell us a little bit about what Lighthouse Global does and where you think Lighthouse is and its maturity. And then I want to go back to the different um, phases. So Lighthouse started in 1990s. And that time it was a document copy services. Our founder, he was very smart to think about how this industry will evolve and just from the document copying for legal firms he started using technology and converting this into a technology enabled business in 2018 
we started using AI and we created our first product called Lighthouse Analytics. People know it in the name of Prism. Mm -hmm. And we started using large language models. That time it was BERT to really come out with use of AI for technology assisted review. Also use the AI for classification for sentiment analysis among other use cases. Recently with the advent of generative AI, we are using generative AI to help improve the legal outcomes and focusing on the use cases that were not actually possible without uh, having specialized human skills. This uh, generative AI use cases we are heavily leveraging um, generative AI to really think about how we can use it for summarization, for coming out with the strategy, for using it for search among the large corpus of documents. So interesting. I think for our listeners too, it's really important that um, you know the old mythology of just being two people in a garage isn't necessarily the only startup story. Because you've experienced a couple places where you've started, you know, in the, in, at, at at Lighthouse at Microsoft, where you've been in a startup mode within an established company, and of course, even established companies can pivot right out of you know a more um, traditional point of view into a new thing. And you have to mix and match those skills from those different stages of uh, startup life or maturity. Uh, so just kind of tying that together, I, I thought that was a really interesting part of your your background too, to uh, just point out. Uh, I know you work with a lot of startups, but it's it's an interesting kind of double skill set. Um, kind of coming back to the startup when you're single threaded focus, what would you say, um, I'm gonna ask this in two ways, um, as a leader culturally, what would be two or three pillars of a culture that would be the right culture at an early startup? So if you think about a startup, the big advantage you have compared to the established companies is the fact that you can move fast. You can make decisions faster. You can be more nimble. You can be flexible. You can do the pivoting. So the first principle I have is your technology strategy should be centered around speed simplicity and flexibility. Mm -hmm. That's the, the first basic principle. And let me give you an example. When I started with my first startup way back in 2006, we extensively used feature flags and we built the tooling for experimentation. It helped us to continuously take our code into production, get it in front of our customers and get their feedback make any product changes that we wanted to make. And I felt that really helped us with the successful product that we were able to create, right? So the first mm -hmm. principle is about use the technology stack that helps you with the speed, simplicity, and flexibility. And the things that people can do is think about building the tooling for experimentation, don't overthink architecture. A lot of companies in the very initial phases start building the complexity. You can always build the complexity. Use the simplicity as much as possible in the initial phases. And also think about leveraging DevOps for the uh, faster development cycle. So that's the principle around the simplicity. The second big thing that I recommend companies to do is only focus on building capabilities that add to your differentiation, which also imply leverage cloud services, use public cloud, use third-party libraries. You want to use the open source, but let somebody else run the open source for you. So those are the, the two basic principles that I have when you're thinking about the tech strategy as an early startup. So that's really helpful. I think when you when you talk about the tech strategy for speed, right? Uh, that is an advantage, and I think it's often I have this. I think that's my Achilles uh, heel. Is I, I love complexity, I love complexity in architecture, but in some ways you have to be really disciplined um, about not getting too far into it before you validate. Let me ask you this though: as you're speedily validating, do you think it's different in the world where are you going to have more? Um, LLMs and Gen AI as part of product development, or do you think um, 
you know, you're going to still go by the sort of traditional mode of like, you know, um, experiments. I can tell you how we are currently approaching it at Lighthouse Global. So in our wave one, we are leveraging the large language models, which are out of box, right? So we're not trying to do any kind of fine tuning. And there is a lot of white space when you think about the customer experience when it comes to the legal industry. In, initially, I was talking about there are a lot of things that required a specialized human skill. Now we have the ability to go and automate all those manual workflows. So I'll give you an example. Any kind of uh, discovery has a lot of privileged documents. And once you identify all these privileged documents, you have to create an audit log. This audit log requires specialized legal experience and knowledge, but it is so manual and repeated task. You go through each of the document and you create the log entry. Now you have the ability to go and fully automate that workflow. So in our first way, we are automating the experiences that were completely manual. Mm -hmm. In our second way, we are going after the experiences that required information retrieval. A lot of people call it as a retrieval augmented generation. So that's a second set of use cases that we are, are targeting. Okay. In a third use case, or in the third way, we're going after the use cases that require us to host our small LLMs and fine tune them for a specific use case. This is a phase when we will start building our IPs, but there's a lot of value to go be the first one in the market with all these innovative solutions. So this is typically like mostly the same startup mindset. This is a sprinting phase, come out with the new experiences, capture the market. Once you have captured the market, go after the more mature use cases. Mm -hmm. The first set of use cases are also helping us with the AI human collaboration, because along with building the technology, we also have to make sure that people in the legal industry, the legal system would be accepting the generative AI. There's a human component, right? And I like the examples you've given in three sections, because I think it really um, underscores the um, the point you made about, you know, adopt technology uh, that's known and reliable and then work on the technology where you have competitive advantage, where you can build a moat, you have special knowledge. And I really like the three examples you gave because it's attacking that in a kind of MVP process. The first one is, hey, you know, we're going to get rid of some of the toil for this community. We know their work process. That's your special IP there. It's not super fancy, right? But it's going to help people get them used to it, lay the seeds, and then you're kind of getting more sophisticated from there with a heavier emphasis on your knowledge of the business rather than an emphasis on platforms. Yes. That's, that's really good. Yeah, yeah, no, I really like that a lot. Um, let me ask you this. When you think about, um, I love this idea of like, we're going to work on things that really differentiate us and not things that are industry standard. What would you suggest for startups or established companies? How do you figure that out as a technology leader um, of what is just sort of standard that comes with platforms or open source tools versus something you can really build that's going to truly add value and not just be kind of a minor update? So if you think about like typical startups, or in many cases, you will find yourself in a situation where you will find out there is a big untapped opportunity. So if I may use an example, I started with Lumatics and they have been capturing a patient health data through the their medical journey. In some cases, they had the data for about 20 plus years, around 170 hospital systems for millions of users, right? And they were using that data for regulatory reporting, but there was no other use case that that they thought about. So we had this treasure trove of data for last 20 plus years. We just use it for reporting. And then we started thinking about, there is a way for us to really monetize the data. And typically, if you really think about it, most of these startups originate because the founder is passionate or has an idea. And they have Not like deep subject, to... subject matter expertise, right? They really yeah. know something, mining, healthcare. Yes. And then you're thinking about like, how do I execute on that idea? So when we started executing on the idea, 
we started using the standard library sets that we will get on issue. Right? So if I incorporate that principle that I talked about, and I initially talked about how you would like to use open source, but you want somebody else to run the open source for you. Same principle is you should be you trying to use the cloud services as much as possible. You should be using the Lambda and serverless design as much as possible. So everything that we did and create to create this health view analytics product line centered around leveraging all the capability everybody else was building, but monetize the data that we have collected in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So our differentiation was the access to the data that nobody else would have. And the idea that we can use this data to help improve the patient outcomes and reduce the cost. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, building on what you're saying, you know, there are a lot of startups and even established companies who are looking to use their treasure trove of data to um, either create a startup business in-house or do a new to the world startup. As a technical lead, if I if I was like, hey, you know what, Pankaj, I've got this killer set of data. Let's start a company. Um, what are some technical advice that you would give me to think about as I'm putting together an architecture or a tech platform to support monetizing my special data? So I, I think obviously before you start any company, you look at the competitive landscape. You're trying to understand who else have us offering. Maybe I can't, I'm going to pause you and just say I cannot emphasize. It cannot be understated how important that is, and I can't tell you how many startups don't do it. It's interesting. Uh, I just want to underscore what you're saying. I think is so so important. Yeah, I I, I think everybody thinks their idea is so unique. So I would really recommend that you go and vet out the idea in the market. It's good to go and talk to people in the same industry or a different industry and at least do your own research before you start executing on the idea. So in, in our case, we actually worked in a close partnership with many of the hospital chains. And we said, we have this data. Here is the kind of use cases we are thinking about. So for example, like one use case that I'm really proud about is reducing the use of blood at the point of care, right? That has a huge, huge benefit in terms of the patient care. What is point of care? What does that mean? So if you're in a hospital, you're going through the surgery, how can we reduce the amount of blood that you would require? It could be if you like all these different use cases, right? These are the things that I, I feel really proud about. But we worked closely with with bunch of our hospital specialists to ensure this is the right idea for us to pursue. Right. In terms of executing on the idea, we talked about how we started using the libraries that we got from Microsoft. And in our case, we actually approached Microsoft and we said we we believe we have this unique idea in the healthcare field. And I'm talking about way back in 2016. And we also leverage a bunch of their technical capabilities and expertise to build on this idea. What's the best way of doing it? So reach out to different people that can help you vet out your ideas with the partners or the potential buyers or users of those products that you're trying to create. And then again, it goes back to make sure before you spend all your time building out everything, do it in the small increment get the feedback from the customers, make any kind of changes that you need to do in your product thinking. Mm -hmm. And then again, go back to the customers and make sure they like what you're building. What Don't you do these products in vacuum. What are your suggestions for, um, you know, when we're talking about medical data or we're talking about almost any kind of data right now, uh, if you're trying to monetize it, there's a lot of privacy and regulatory concerns right away, uh, which could be sort of, daunting if you're starting a, a, a data-driven startup of some kind. Um, do you have any suggestions for those who are thinking like, how can I maximize my speed, but still be like a responsible user of data and AI? Yes. So again, you have to be thoughtful about the use case. In our use case, we were not using anything that was using any personally identifiable information for a patient. Mm -hmm. We were using the data in aggregate mm -hmm. and think about with different care for a patient with different with the same medical and family history what are the best outcomes mm -hmm. 
So this was an example where you're using classification, you're using clustering, and you're not really using a specific patient data. We mm -hmm. were not trying to monetize the patient data. We were trying to get the insights from the collection of data that we had. Yeah, interesting. It's like, um, you know, there's a lot of tools out there like differential privacy and um, synthetic data. But in general, what I'm taking away from what you're saying is um, find some way to obfuscate or generalize any PII or private data such that you can feel sure the outcomes can be used, you know, effectively yeah. for your use case. Okay, um, and, let's talk. And if I may clarify, right? So what we did was we used this data to train our model versus just using the data as is. Interesting. And then the model is really what you were licensing, not the, the data. Yes. And we're using the model to come out for a particular patient. What would be the best uh, plan for care? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I like that. Um, let's talk about the next thing, which is um, the awkward growth from a startup into a more established firm. It's been, I'll give you my experience, which has been under 80 people. It's so cozy. It's so great to be together and you're all on your pirate ship, but it's hard to get things done. It gets harder and harder. And so you have to grow, but it's a very awkward time. Um, what is, what's your observation of that time of growth? What, what, actually, let me ask you this. When do you move out of startup mode into being a little bit bigger company in your mind? Like what, what are the what's the bounded context of being a small startup or a mid-sized one? So for me, the yardstick is the number of developers you have. Okay. When you are a small startup, you have one big team. When I say one big team, I mean like 10, 15 developers. They all are working on the same code. Uh, pretty much working on the different parts of the same application. Everybody can build, deploy, run the code on their lo local machine. Mm -hmm. And then you start getting into this place where you have like 30, 40, 50 developers. And they can't really work together. And you have to start thinking about the way you have to... This is a phase when you have to think about refactoring your organization. And this is also the time when you have to start thinking about refactoring your code and bringing contract-based development such that everybody can work on different parts of the application, but independently. This is a phase where I've seen a bunch of interesting things happening. You are no longer the founder-led team. You started hiring people from outside. I have seen a lot of passionate debate about the tool sets and technology everybody would like to use. Different people have this different uh, religious allegiance to a particular technology stack. And at the local level, each of these decisions sound good. But when you think about the global perspective, these things become challenging. And that's where, yes, it's still a cozy family, but the, the rift starts happening in that cozy family. Actually, I love that. I'm going to steal that because I had always been looked at kind of overall headcount, but you're right. It's the number of developers at the heart of the matter uh, that kind of dictate not the whole culture, but a big part of it. Um, that's interesting. I like that approach. So when you're thinking about like that awkward expansion from being 15 developers to a more you know established firm, let's say you're the founder, the CEO, you've had, a, you know, you've had a lot of control, um, you know, or what as a founder, like what would be like three pieces of advice at this juncture, like three things that you should definitely keep top of mind when you're growing? Okay. So when you're growing at certain scale, the founder is no longer a thought leader. In many cases, if they don't learn how to delegate, they become the bottleneck. I have been in places where the founders would write the copious amount of specs and everybody will go and execute on those specs. People never learn how to do the decision, make the decisions on their own. There's no clarity about where the decision should be made because everybody looks at the founder. So I would highly encourage the founders to start thinking about scaling the thought leadership, making sure people understand what decisions can be made at what level. And this is also the phase for people to start thinking about bunch of other things like what is your data strategy are you thinking about your operational stability and efficiency because yes as a small team 
as a small startup it was all about speed simplicity and efficiency it was about taking your concepts to the market first and now you're trying to be a marathon runner it's all mm-hmm. about endurance and you have to start thinking about building these basic constructs that will be required as you transition into a more established company have to think about uh, operational stability and efficiency it's not going to be about innovation all the time mm-hmm. you have to also compete in terms of the efficiency and cost security becomes a big big item so sorry this was more than three things that you asked me <laughs> that's okay there are a lot of things <laughs> that the, the founder has to start thinking about right now otherwise you will find yourself in a place where no level of innovation can pay for the operational instability you have in your environment and i've seen a lot of companies going through this growth phase finding themselves in this awkward state where they now have to spend most of their time thinking about the operational challenges they have to not think about the developer productivity and mm-hmm. i have been there two times it's 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 interesting how all these very impressive startups have found themselves in the same state it's tough i think you have to be like a particular type certainly as a technical founder right you have a technical vision and you also probably have the skills to execute on it so that's a special you're already special right um i think it's to me like it's an, almost an emotional challenge to delegate to deal with people who aren't maybe you see you're you're nodding your head have you know what i mean like it's almost uh, emotional right yes Yes, um, and this is a hard transition for the founders. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's easy to talk about, but I think it's hard to actually do. One piece of advice, I think, a technical. Let's say there's a technical founder who's feeling this pain right now. <laughs> I, so many technical founders have told me, like, I just want to do coding, and I don't code anymore. I spend all my time selling. Um, would you say that, like, sales or you know, is the most important thing to expand into as you delegate? thought leadership or like what what's the checklist of things to worry about first as you're expanding out of um, startup mode? Oh, yes, obviously, right. Um, I was pretty much answering it from the technical lens, but most of the technical founders, they're not good at selling. If you're good at selling, you probably would not be so technical uh, mm-hmm. writing the code. Uh, obviously, you'll have to think about like hiring some specialist before everybody knew what to do everybody was seller in my startups the first few initial sales were made by me i would go in front of the customers talk to them but at some point in time it's no longer scalable plus Mm -hmm. selling is also a very specialized skill you have to start thinking about bringing that specialized skill set it would be for sales it will be for at some point in time you'll have to think about your marketing strategy You'll have to think about somebody leading the operational uh, systems for your team. You will also have to make sure that you're no longer the the solo technical decision maker. Like you can't really be the guy directing all the 40, 50 people uh, dev team, telling them what to do on daily basis. Yeah. About like delegating, bringing in the right leaders. There are times when the, as you mentioned, There are technical founders who probably don't enjoy managing people. You will have to really think about how you're going to get the complementary skill sets to be successful. Right. You have to cooperate. Managing managing is not a fun activity, right? Not everybody likes managing. I think some people do. Uh, they're not typically tech leads. Uh, they, um, although if you do find that unicorn, you should hang on to that person who <laughs> is able to do that. Um, no, I think it's interesting and not to overly psychologize, but I do think, you know, you have to have the ability to delegate and put up with mistakes and things you don't agree with until people figure it out. And then I think this part that I'm talking about is when you're a technical founder, you have to have the humility to go back to your funders or go get advice and learn something that maybe you didn't think was that cool, but you have to learn it. And I'd say the same thing for marketing and business founders. I've I've given that advice many times, you know, these are technology products. So you have to be, a you have to get somewhat technical. You don't have to code, but you do have to know how it works. Um, I think it goes both ways for founders. Um, so let me ask you real quick about, um, this is an interesting question I got recently about Gen AI. 
And I want to talk a little bit about how generative AI and LLMs may be affecting how startups think about scaling, right? Um, one question is, um, you know, what if you have a startup that isn't about generative AI and LLMs? It's not about that. Do you, you know, there's this whole question of like, do you add a wrapper or some kind of like widget so that, you know, funders will pay attention to you? Uh, do you stick to your guns and say like, you know, not every use case is a, um, you know, an LLM use case. Uh, so if I was a startup coming to you and saying like, hey, you know, we don't really have an LLM today, what would you say? See, anything that you're trying to do, I strongly believe you have to have a strong customer perspective. You have to think from the viewpoint of customer, how it, it will benefit the customer. Mm -hmm. And I do understand that it's easy to go and talk about generative AI. There are a lot of people who would be happy to fund the initiative. You just have to use the right buzzwords. But I don't think that will translate in the, into success in long term. Right? You have to stay true to the to stay true to your mission. It's obviously important that you are thoughtful about using the new technology as it comes, right? If you have the ability to use generative AI, you ought to think about using it in the use cases. Otherwise, you can't really create a differentiated product line, right? So it depends upon, upon a specific use case. But even for the mature companies, right, we, we were using AI. There are a lot of things that we can do with the generative AI. How do you really think about revamping your roadmap, right? Even though there is no VC that you're trying to make a pitch, but you still have to be thoughtful about using the technology in the most meaningful manner. Mm -hmm. If you're a startup, I, I think my advice would be if you think there's a leverage, think about utilizing the new technology as much as possible because any new technology typically helps you with efficiency. It helps you with scale. And if you're not leveraging those tool sets, you would find it difficult to create a differentiated experience for your customer. But again, tied to your customer, think about how your customer will benefit from the new technology. Yeah, so don't just uh, append it to whatever you're thinking about today, but be thoughtful about an integrated story that is part of your story, right? Uh, and and resonates. I think ultimately, right now, it's almost like you have to sort of, I would say, rub some rub some Gen AI in it, and it'll feel better, right? <laughs> but yeah. that's what that's what investors are looking for. But I think customers are looking for a, a cogent product story that holds together. That said, um, you know, it's interesting uh, from your perspective, you've worked with a lot of companies. Um, I, I liked your healthcare example in particular that are like business to business, data intensive. Um, if you were to sit down with a technical lead of a company of like 300 people, what would uh, you suggest to them to think about technically to scale? Like what are some scaling gotchas? Yeah, so let's say um, I've had some initial success. I've had a couple of good customers, but now I want to expand to selling to multiple enterprises in the medical field or finance, something that's like highly regulated, complicated. And I do now have to think about architecture. Um, what should I be thinking about? Okay. Um, so in the very beginning, when you're trying to think about creating a product, you have to be clear about whether it's going to be a multi-tenant or a single tenant especially if you're getting into the into healthcare field, it's a very important dis decision you need to have based upon your use case, right? If it's gonna be multi-tenant, you have to think about how you're gonna be doing the data segregation. More than one time I have seen companies not thinking about the right org structure, not mm -hmm. thinking about the, the roles and permissions model that they need to implement and they have to always go back and try to fix their implementation after they rebuild it's a rebuild right it's a rebuild after they have achieved a good scale right i have seen people not thinking about security and compliance especially if you are in this uh, legal or the medical field you have to really invest in security and compliance and it's not a fun thing to do early on because you are trying to build new things, but you will have to invest on security. You also have to think about the data governance that you need to have. You are leveraging data. It's a healthcare data. 
who can access it, how long you keep it, what's the data lifecycle uh, management story you have. You have to start incorporating all those things as part of your overall tech stack. In many cases, you will have data that's residing in different places. It's not easy to bring them together. So I have gone through the places where we created the data pipeline, created this, this centralized clearing house where we were able to add the semantic meaning to the data and also make sure that we can find out any kind of security or privacy issues. You're logging the data. Are you capturing any kind of uh, usernames or passwords or date of birth or any other thing that would be private? Yeah, I like all those suggestions. I'm going to clip that out and make every entrepreneur listen to it uh, for early decisions that uh, can make your life easier if you get successful. Um, one of the things, just to, I, as I'm thinking about what you're saying, it kind of pulls together one of the, uh, you mentioned that your organization is improving legal outcomes uh, with your new, you know, your upcoming roadmap and your approach to Gen AI. I'm just curious if you could share a little, if you can share a little bit with us about where you're going with that. I think it's really interesting. So way back in 2018, 2019, we launched a product that time it was called Prism. Uh, and the- Let me ask you, how many people use, like give us a, like Prism's very widely used. So yes, we, we launched Prism in 2019. It was using the state of art, large language model, um, but based on large language model at that particular point of time. And the legal industry is going through the cycles to adopt technology. Right? So the use case that we have is uh, technology assisted review. How can you take a large corpus of data, identify certain key documents? How can you identify information which is considered to be privileged? Mm -hmm. so those were the use cases. How can you do the sentiment analysis? How can you find out toxic communication? So there were a lot of use cases which are not really easy without use of technology, right? And with the AI, once you have a trained model, it's easy to apply the model on the corpus of documents. With generative AI, many of those use cases don't even require us to train the model, right? So the use cases like summarization, I can feed any kind of document, I can write a prompt, and then the model knows how to create a log entry. These were very intensive uh, manual processes that we can really automate. That saves hours and hours for for all these uh, law firms and the big enterprises. Our primary users are big enterprises and the big law firms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, well, listen, I just really appreciate you giving us some insight on uh, the amazing technical stuff that's going on at Lighthouse and also the benefit of your experience working with uh, many different startups. I think this is such a core question right now of how to scale up uh, given the economic headwinds and the advent of Gen AI. I think this is a perfect time to give your advice, especially to technical founders. Uh, is there anything I forgot to ask about that you wanted to speak on for these uh, uh, listeners? Oh, there are, uh, obviously, once you're in the industry for 25 plus years, there are a lot of experience, uh, but I, I think we talked about many of those things. If I can just give one one advice uh, yes that'll be awesome so this is based upon my experience uh, typically people are looking for a playbook that they can apply but we all go through a slightly different set of circumstances the challenges that we see would be slightly different but if you look underneath they all boil down to certain set of use cases certain set of root causes, right? So I would strongly encourage anybody who is starting their startup journey to always stay curious, to always stay agile, stay flexible, don't shy away from experimentation, 
keep the focus on customers, build the part of technology that helps them with the differentiation. Because if they stay true to their mission, they will find success. And it's easy as a startup to lose heart because you don't see some easy success. Easy success or the early success is not a guarantee that you'll be successful in the long term. And the vice versa is also true. I think that's really generous and thoughtful advice uh, for uh, those who are in, in, on this journey right now, because uh, it's it's challenging day to day to keep those uh, principles in mind. So I'm sure anybody listening to this would really appreciate it. Um, Pankaj, it was amazing to meet you. Thank you so much for being on the show today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. It was my pleasure to be here.